All right, let's get started. I don't know where I this. So, um, two minutes and see if somebody else shows up. You can watch it. Agenda for today. So we will discuss case study that's due tonight. Uh, discussion was due yesterday or early this morning. Any feedback from the guest lecture? I liked him. Uh, it's, he definitely put in a bigger picture about not just what's the mechanics of a do, do A, B plus C, but why are we there in the first place? You, mean, yeah. you might miss that, you know, there's a whole underlying component um, that you're looking from here to there, but there might be a, all this over here that if you're not addressing the whole concept, you might be missing out on a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. The real, the real goal of the project. Exactly. I think it's an emerging paradigm. So actually I've invited Dave to come over here on April 13th and 14th. He's actually giving a lecture here on campus on the 14th. Um, I don't know the specifics, but again, jobs to be done could be the same lecture, different, I don't know what he's presenting. Anyway, he's physically going to be here and he's going to work with my group to think differently about projects. It's cool that it could be applied to software and really any. Yeah, anything. Product. Yeah, yeah. It's a product design. He's a product design guy. Yeah, absolutely. So um, good feedback. I got emails from several of you as well. So that's, um, that's good. Uh, let's see. We have an article of the week. Then we'll have, today we will talk about lean development and continuous improvement. And then um, I will assign discussion four, which is due the 19th of March. Yeah. Okay. So, so we had jobs to be done lecture last time, and this is a good article about what makes truly great products great. Um, this is by the founder of, or the current CEO of LinkedIn, and um, you know I agree with him. It's a very short read, so um, take a look at that and um, get your thoughts gathered. Um, we will have a discussion around this, likely, okay? Um, so I will post that question in discussion, but uh, make sure you read this article. Uh, it's a short read. All right, let's talk about lean development. So um, we talked about Agile, we talked about Scrum, um, uh, you know, you probably heard another topic called lean development. So let's start, find out what's lean. Um, so lean was originally done at Toyota because, you know, we had Ford and others, well, you know, more costly manufacturing and, you know, lean was developed um, how the manufacturing process at Toyota, you know, lower cost and all of that. That doesn't mean, you know, getting lower labor or anything like that. So let's, let's figure out what's, what's lean. Um, lean is um, maximizing customer value um, while eliminating waste. Waste means lots of different ways. We'll talk about it. This waste means, you know, it's not just you design and throw it away. That's not the waste we are talking about. We're talking about a lot of different things where you have um, waste. So, you know, I don't want to go into that. We'll, we'll talk in detail what's waste. Um, so lean is essentially about thinking changes, the focus from optimizing separate technologies, assets, units, um, and processes. So it's about thinking as a whole and, you know, making it a lot more efficient. Um, that's what lean is all about. So uh, let's see, I have some problems with my slides. Okay, so, um, 
So Toyota kind of just did this uh, way back in the 80s, um, sort of built to order. Built to order means um, you don't manufacture things before everything comes, you know, comes together, or you don't manufacture, you don't build things and put them in inventory and wait till the, the parts are assembled. So they all arrive at the right time so that you're not wasting inventory parts or you're not wasting uh, the time it sits around and you spent the money and it sits around in the warehouse and then you bring the parts to assemble. So it's about just being able to assemble on the fly. Pull rather than a push. Right, right. And also just expecting when that's needed and then trying to do the downstream work up front and just arrive that in place. So an example of applying that in software, a simple way to think about that is, let's say you're designing a website. Um, what do you need to have before you design a website? A database in some fashion, uh, a couple of different components, and some will take longer than others. Um, so you would need to have requirements first, and then you have to have a design, then you have to have an architecture, then you start writing code, right? So you don't want to jump in and write code right away. So or the simplest way to look about that, uh, look at that is, hey, if you had a website design, a, a wireframe design, and somebody can work on the development of that, and then the next page can, can be designed at the same time while you're writing code for the first page. So don't design the entire website and just wait for the developers to start working on every single page. Let's say the web page has 24 pages that you have to design. So instead of going and designing all four 24 pages and then giving it to developers and then they go and work on it, you get a flow of, okay, we are going to have show this page first and this page first. If you click here, you go here. You design the flow and then you design one page at a time, just ahead of time before the code is written. So that's one example, okay? So, um, so optimize the manufacturing process, minimize the inventory, um, and, and also, you know, showing respect to the responsibility on the production line workers and getting their input into optimizing the process, um, allowing decisions to be changed. You know, sometimes you figure out while you're going through it, oh, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. We should be actually doing this. And that input, a lot of times, comes from bottom up. Doesn't Toyota require everybody, if they see something, they have to say, hey, yeah. you could do it better? Or... Yeah, that's right. They, they don't want, you know, total commitment from the entire employee base, right? Definitely. So, um, so that's one example of that. Other examples... Um, you know, uh, you guys have heard of Dell assembling PCs to order, right? And a lot of times, you know, one of the things that impressed me about, I don't know, 15 years ago, when Dell first set up the site and you can order, you can pay for it, and then they go and manufacture that. They don't manufacture and keep it in, um, and then, you know, you go and sell it. That's the traditional model of buying a PC, right? So built to order was created your computer is built to order. You can configure any way you want. And that wasn't there 15, 20 years ago. When you ordered your PC, you just have standard three configs, you know, you go buy those. Right? You still do, probably. But Dell allowed you to have, hey, how much memory you want, how much this, how much that. And then you could configure, and then they ship it to, you know, China or wherever they were manufacturing or Thailand and that order gets made. Yeah, they don't even make the parts, right? They just... They yeah, they just pull that in, all the supply chain, you know. Yeah, the whole supply chain optimization happened at Dell, right? Um, so the other one is um, FedEx is a, is a good example. Um, overnight delivery of packages, you know, they, they had just in time as well. You know, they come and pick up, you know, if you have something to be picked up, otherwise they don't show up. But, you know, your postal office goes to every house. It doesn't matter. You know, they go through every single road.
Yeah, right. But here, you know, FedEx picked up, delivered, and they figured out what plane, where. It's basically supply chain, right? Supply chain optimization. Um, another example is uh, LL Beans, which is um, sports clothing, right? And then, um, and then eBay is the same thing as well, right? I mean, they don't they don't have inventory, you know. They get it from somebody else, and and they're able to sell it as well. Okay, so these are good examples of um, lean thinking. You know, supply chain optimization basically is um, what's what's being done. So, a lot of those thinking has been taken into account um, and um, built the foundation for the lean software development. Um, so, so, the, so the thinking here is most errors are systematic in nature, not just, not just a specific line of code or a product or something like that is uh, not the one that caused the error. So it's the whole, it's, it's the whole system, systemic thing is what caused the error. That's one of the belief. The other belief is people really want to do good things if you, you know, they want to do a good job, that's generally, you know, the assumption that make, respect people, not try to tell them, you know, what to do and, you know, trust them with decision making. Um, and then the assumption, business will try and always try and maximize the value that they give to the customers. So those are the foundations of lean. Given that, you know, what, um, what lean as a framework, let's talk through that a little bit. So, so companies don't want to label um, anything as lean because there's a bad connotation, right? It says, oh, they're cutting costs, you know, they're cutting people's salaries or the number of hours they're working, all that kind of stuff. That's not, yeah, that's, yeah, trim it down. That's not, that's not the thinking. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's trying to build a framework, where, you know, that's around, what we call just in time, okay? So do the things just in time, but that doesn't mean you don't plan or anything like that. You continue to plan, but you don't go and act on it. You don't implement it until you truly need it, okay? So that's the framework. Um, so just in time is improving um, the ROI by reducing the process inventory and carrying cost, you know, that's the manufacturing side, you know, we just talked about. So if you needed 10 doughs and you're only going to manufacture 10 cars today, it makes sense to have 10 doughs, not 100 doughs waiting for them, okay? So just manufacture what you need down the line. And then if there's 10 doughs that needs to be ready for assembly today and that they are ready yesterday in the... Um, say the warehouse. So there's another factory that could be manufacturing that 10 doughs somewhere else, but they need to ship that and have it ready in the assembly factory. Now the other site where they're actually manufacturing the dough may have to wait for the glasses, the handles from different suppliers. So they need to make sure their supply chain is working towards, their goal is to, hey, deliver 10 doughs to the final assembly plant every single day. So th they can optimize. They know the goals, they can optimize their supply chain and down the stream as well. So that's, so what are the advantages of doing that? What are the disadvantages of doing that? If somebody ever, if there's ever a, a bottleneck somewhere or something it happens to, hey, we got behind today, and, and all of a sudden, 10 doors get delivered, but hey, we're only ready for two of them, you know. Exactly. Yeah, they have to manage the risk. They do have to manage the risk and make sure that they have enough. Let's say they have 20 doors ready all the time. Only 10 they ship. They keep the 10 instead of 100 in the inventory. They can always mitigate for one day. So we can have the flexibility of one day tolerance. 
But if we had three-day tolerance, then, you know, we have to have 30 days, 30 dose, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so they might take the risk and say, hey, it's 90% of the time, it's one day, right? It's just one day delay we have in our supply chain, 90% of the time. There may be a case that is a hurricane, the whole thing is down. There's nothing you can do about that, and you can deal with that, right? But you don't manufacture 100 and keep them in the warehouse, and then the requirements change, the new design come in, you can never use it. A whole bunch of wasted inventory. Wasted effort, not just inventory, not just space, all the effort that's wasted, all the raw material, everything, it's gone. Okay, so that's how the supply chain optimization at Toyota worked. And all these things was um, thought through in the 2000s and all in software and say, hey, can we, can we think through the downstream work that needs to be done in order to assemble a set of software and implement that? So when you said, you know, you went to Pivotal, they just work on the next 10 stories. That's what they care about. They don't, the next major features they need to deliver. They don't care about five features down the line. Um, they know that they have to work on it roughly, you know, at a high level, but they don't go and decompose those tasks right now. Yeah, they have a hierarchy of what needs to get done. And yeah, they, so somebody might, a business analyst may be working on the next set of epics. You're working on the current epic. The next topic may be somebody else is working on it. The two, three releases, I mean, the next release, somebody may be working with a customer on next release. But they don't need to work on the details of all of that all at once. Okay? So it applies to software as well. Um, so many philosophies of just in time is managing the inventory waste. Okay? So, you know, this happens in my group. You know, we have a UI designer in our group. We have 15 programmers and one UI designer. And the UI designer works on three different projects. And each project has three developers on it. And so he works on three projects, so he needs to supply designs for three projects all the time. So he has done the discovery, done all the work, and got the flow of the website or the application, but he doesn't design every single page right away. Oh, that makes sense. So, so he, he asks the developers, what's the most critical, what's the first page you're going to work on? And I'll get you a design. And I'll stay one or two sprints ahead of you. So, that, so he gets to work on three different designs at the same time. So he works Monday, Tuesday on this design, this one page, Another one page, another one page, three different projects. So he gets the designs ready, the page layout, the fonts, the characters, CU logo, all of that he assembles and generates HTML, CSS, so that the JavaScript can be written by the developers for that page. And then he works on the second app, you know, the, the next most important page that they need. Gets that ready. So when he does all of that, He's doing next week's coding work, the designs for next week's coding work. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Having one UI designer, isn't that a risk if he ever got sick or got hurt? Yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, Lou, in this case, um, you know, there are back, you know, back, uh, back end tasks that we could work on a lot of times. Um, it's not always you're working on the UI a lot of times. So, same, I'm just giving you one example, right? Um, but if he gets sick, if he's out, um, if he gets stuck in a project, we do have design backlogs. Yeah. So a lot of times he has done, so he'll give a rough framework. He might not do the HTML, CSS. He'll give the layouts. A lot of times, okay, he, this is faster. I'll just give you the layout or the screen cutout or what the screen looks like, and then the developers will go do some of that work. Okay. So that's, that's one way... Um, one way they do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so the whole idea here is you just do it just ahead of when it's required. 
So um, in the manufacturing world, um, inventory is waste. You know, we talked about that. Um, if you look at this graph, traditional ordering cost is the more items you order, you know, your cost goes down, right? Right. So um, ordering quantity, the annual cost goes down, and then your carrying cost, and you have a, in a section point, you know, that's the optimal order, right? This is your cost to carry, and, and you can project that, and this is supply chain, you can figure that out. But in just in time, you could lower that much, much lower. Okay. You just manufacture what's needed, and you just stay two or three steps ahead of what's required. Yeah, the ordering bulk. Yep. Mm-hmm. Not risking, you know, every way. Say it's a risk. Management you do have to do. Right. But then once you have established a cadence, then you know what to optimize. Say, for instance, if you think about a car dealer, you know, let's say there are three different manufacturers that he, you know, this person is getting the cars from. And, um, and he has to maintain an inventory of 30 cars. He has figured out 10 of each manufacturer five, three different models, and two of each in each model, and he's got an inventory, then he knows which cars to sell, which cars to order uh, the next year, the next model, or he's short of inventory. All of that, they have to figure out supply chain, right? And then if he sells two cars, then where should he get the next set of cars from? When will he get it? Can he sell ahead of time? Can he get down payment from people without even seeing the car or showing a sample car and, you know, getting the order? Like, for instance, when I ordered my car, you know, I wanted back seats, heated back seats. And, and they, didn't, they didn't have that. My kids wanted heated back seats. Only the front seats are heated in the standard car. So you just won't, yeah, you just won't get it. So I had to wait, like, four months. But he showed me a car with everything else, not except the back, back seat is not heated. But he placed, he got my down payment and got the car ordered from Alabama. That's where the manufacturing facility is. And six weeks later, my car was delivered. So he showed, he optimized his inventory to zero, essentially. Right? Otherwise, he has to bring the car, hold it here until somebody buys the car. Right? So custom orders and all of that kind of stuff, um, they did a pretty good job of doing that, right? You show the car very similar, just that one feature is different, sell that. So that's just in time, yeah. So this is happening. This is not new. But so what does lean mean for software development? Let's talk about that. So that's the foundation. What does it mean? Um, it's a set of tools that we have in... Um, uh, in actually doing software development. It's not a methodology. It's a set of thinking tools um, that um, software development refers as um, it reliably produces the software output. Customers get it as quickly as possible, um, but it allows for customers to change their mind if they need it. And so that's what, that's what um, lean means for software development. So that's a little bit abstract. So let's think about what's, what's the perspective of lean. Basically, just what I talked about, look at time, not resource utilization. So you're not trying to optimize the resources utilized. You're trying to look ahead and then so in thinking about the development process as a, as a fast, flexible flow. Okay, we just need to get this done. We know the process. Where can we optimize? Just like I mentioned, you know, UX design, uh, staying a step ahead of actual coding, and then the deployment and the marketing team, you know, just getting ready, getting everybody aligned. Um, so you as a project manager has a lot to coordinate. That's what it means, right? 
So you have to understand the different steps where you can optimize. You're not wasting time on the developers, just basically unblocking the developer. If the developer is blocked, that's actually a waste, right? So, um, so basically, you as a project manager is trying to lower the buffer between um, the different steps, like requirements, UX design, HTML, CSS, JavaScript coding writing, backend writing, database table creation. You know, this may be the steps that you have to do. Can you done, get some of these things done in parallel? Can, yeah, and then stay ahead of dependencies um, ahead of time. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can create a database table because you know in order to do this story, we have to create the database table. So let the developer independently create the database tables and be ready with that. They might do the back end and be ready with that while the design is happening. But they can't do the front page because without the design, they can't do that. And without the back end, they can't do that either. Right? So they are working on the back end development and the database design without writing the front end code because they have to wait for the UI design. Does that make sense? But in order for the whole system to work, they have to have the back end and the database, right? So, so they may just delay putting the page together and just work on the back end and then assemble everything when the design's ready. Does that make sense? So back end's all your structure, foundation, essentially. But people back end, other things. It could time. be calls to the database. It could be APIs, the back end. So the way, um, the way uh, can I write here? to do. Back to PC? Oh, yeah, it's ready. Okay. Third icon. This one? Uh, one of those two. Okay. So let's say, let's say this is the database. All right. And then um, set of APIs. And this could be, each one of these could be talking to that. And then the front end is the, the web page. You know, it's got a header, it's got a footer. And then the app and the UI here. And um, so this is the design of that. And then you have to write HTML. You have to write CSS, style sheets. You have to write JavaScript. And the JavaScript calls these APIs. OK? Does that make sense? So this is the UI UX design that needs to happen. So they could create table. That could be one task, right? Table is one task. Um, second one is APIs. They could be working that in parallel. While this is developer. And this is UI designer. They could be working on um, UI, um, CSS, HTML, right? So they could work on this piece. The developer could be working on this piece. This piece is the one that connects both of that, and that could be delayed. You could hold off on that one. Yeah, you can't really do a lot of that unless you have. If you don't have both parts. You can't connect. Okay. So, so I think that's, this is why a project manager needs to understand what are the components, what depends on what, and, and then be able to assemble them in the right order. So the best way to eliminate waste is do not build what you don't need, right? It's just delay. Yeah, so don't build, um, 
don't build the next UI page until this one is done. Just focus on that and get that done, right? Or maybe stay one step ahead, but not 10 step ahead, okay? Because if you give the UI designer more effort and say, hey, go create all 24 pages, and then we find out in the third page that we have to change the logos, then he has to go change all 24 pages logos, which you don't want to do. So he only created three, he just changes all those three, and he's done. Or the fonts are not in compliance with CU guidelines. That's another one. Okay? So that's what we are talking about. So your process is your baseline for change, you know. So you got one set of pages out, then that is your baseline. Now you know you got one feature out and it's in production. Now you know how this all works. Now you repeat that same pattern, right? Get the back end done, get the database done, get the UI designer going, and then they all come together and assemble the piece. Nice, pretty uh, product, I've been asking. Yep. So the other thing that is a lean perspective is anything that blocks the UI developer or the back-end developer or the front-end developer is considered a waste. So that they're waiting for somebody else. And that is waste, actually. So is there, is there a task you could paralyze that you could do while waiting? Then you as a project manager should make sure that, that you are doing that. Okay? So that's the, that's the thinking behind Lean. All right, now let's talk about this specific three people who sort of identified in that article below that you guys should just read through it. Um, so shortening cycle time reduces waste and increases quality. So that means this time to produce this one unit of work, and you could be doing, to do 24 pages, it, it could be 24 units of work, okay? So if you shorten this time, you actually shorten the whole thing, right? Because you apply the, the, um, the reduce the waste in one case, then you reduce the waste in all of that. It compounds, right? And then it, it also increases the quality because you got one thing done right and it works, and you got the pattern. Now it's a lot faster. Yeah. Um, you tend to get waste lower quality. Um, you tend to get waste and lower quality when you increase the time in between. Uh, that's that's another principle that you know. You, when you increase the time in between these, say this is process uh, page one, and let's say page two, and if there's time in between this that they're doing other work, you're trying to reduce that between the two, okay? Um, so, so you, as a project manager, really need to coordinate, okay, now we are going to go to page two, that the entire team is on page two. That optimizes because your conversation is in the context. You're not working on, nobody's left behind on page one. The entire team moves to page two, and the conversation is all about in context. Does that make sense? Yeah, because if, if some people are working on page one and the others are working on page two, there's a lot of miscommunications over there, right? So the developer, a good UI developer, stays a step one step ahead, but not a whole lot beyond that, okay? They're trying to optimize that too. So you, you will get the information when you get it, and that's what that means, you know, that you're working on the context of the page and not working on something else down the line. 
So like, you know, you have 24 pages, you, you don't want to talk about, say, page seven right now because you're just working on You as a project manager should be aware of it. You've got to work on page seven, but I'm not going to give them the information about page seven at this point. Just don't waste time on that, okay? Because you're trying to keep the team in context. So um, when you make an error and when you discover error, um, you are trying to optimize that as well. Um, and then the last thing is making decisions too early increases the risk of waste. And that's what I just said, you know, like you're talking about page seven, you know, that's a waste of time at this point, right? Yeah, and so, yeah, that's right. You're not trying to make a decision for something that's going to come down the line. You're just trying to make a decision at that point. Kind of sometimes feels like it's counterintuitive. Sometimes it looks like, oh, you know, don't, don't I want to know everything before I start working? That's not the case, not a time. You want to know the overall view, objective, the vision, but that doesn't mean you know everything, right? That makes sense to you? We're talking about lean principles. I know you came in late. Different methods, and they include lean. Introduce the concept? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, so going further and talking about this, um, so excess work in progress also increases both waste and risk. So, so try and keep the scope within the sprint and just sizing the work that goes within the sprint correctly makes a lot, reduces a lot of waste. That means, let's say you have 10 stories in a sprint, okay? Say so this sprint has, and you know this, you, you're not gonna get to this one. So then you should, your sprint should be just focused on this at all only, and you should just immediately move this to backlog and just focus on that. Um, just trying to do too much also. So that's why velocity is important in a sprint and you understand velocity a lot better, okay? Um, increasing the number of concurrent projects without increasing the resources also, you know, introduces waste. So I don't do that for all the projects. Um, like for instance, you know, I talked about the UI UX designer is working on multiple projects. You know, you, he has to be senior enough. He has to understand the context of the project. He spent three months understanding each one of these projects separately. He did user discovery, workflow design, not the page design, all of that upfront, so that he's able to switch tasks between them, okay? But he has to attend three different meetings. He has to attend three different sprints. And he's somebody, you know, is very talented who can handle that. But you don't want the entire team doing that. Yeah. So large batches also cost waste, you know, like if, if you can't size your sprint and everybody is not accurately predict and, you know, causes waste as well because they would have started on this story and they would have started on this story, they would have started on this story, they would have started on that, and then they find out they can't do this. Or they didn't identify the dependency on this one. Without this one getting done, you can't touch this. So why even waste time? Okay, so that's why the blockage, what blocks you from doing this story that you as a project manager should understand. That's why in the standups, you ask what you did yesterday, what you're gonna do tomorrow, and then what's blocking. Constantly, you as a project manager should be asking the question, what's stopping you? Is there anything I can do so that you're unblocked? Even me as a manager, I don't project manage, but manage pro multiple projects, every single time I meet with every one of my developers, I constantly ask the fact, are you blocked? You know, Is there anything I can get you that will move you faster? Is there anything that is stopping you? Are you waiting for information from somebody else? 
all of that kind of question, you as a project manager should be asking. Switching one task to another task, it's just like a computer, right? In memory, your task, you run several programs, and you have fixed memory on your computer, the system's going to trash. It has a context switch. So um, it's unavoidable. Some of the people has to be switching context, like the UX designer. But um, you don't want the entire team switching context every single time. Um, working on more than one project at a time decreases person's efficiency. Again, the same thing applies, you know, UX designer has a tough job, in, in my group at least. They're not dedicated for one project, they're dedicated for multiple projects. So that's, that's kind of tough. The other one is ignoring risk may cause waste. I think we talked about that, right? In the supply chain, um, you know, if you, if you know that sometimes you're going to run into inventory not being ready, you know, that could, that's not managing risk. So it may be worthwhile to keep an extra 10, right? So when you, when you order a new iPhone, I don't know, maybe a Mac, I don't know how many of you have done that online. Have you done that? Order your computer online? When I ordered my Mac, I mean, several Macs I have, your shipping label gets created right away. And it's shipping from, I don't know if it is Chengdu, China, or I don't know exact location in China. The shipping of FedEx item is from China all the way. The order comes from China, it goes to, flies to Alaska, and then it flies to Kentucky, then it gets delivered to your home. So the order that you placed on Apple website gets shipped out directly to the factory, and then two days later, it tells the FedEx operator, don't pick up today, two days you pick it up. So everything is just optimized, you know, it'll be ready, the config, the special config you wanted with 32 gig of memory, not the standard 8 gig of memory, and um, the 5K display that you wanted, and, and the disk that you wanted, all of that is a config to order, and it all gets assembled, and the FedEx is notified to pick up in 48 hours. Uh, it will be all ready for them to pick up 48 hours. It's not today, but the shipping label is created. So FedEx itself thinks about how many space they need to have on the plane that flies from Chengdu to Alaska, and then the next plane that carries from Alaska to Kentucky where their where the main warehouse is. And from Kentucky, it's a local distribution to, say, Colorado and to Tennessee. So they, they want to have that shipping label created 48 hours ahead. Why? Because they can optimize their flights. They can use every single space that they have on the plane. Okay? So, so FedEx even incentivizes Apple and says, if you created your shipping label 48 hours ahead, then we can give you a discount because we know that we can predict our demand. Does that make sense? So that's the way, you know, software develop project manager. This is a very important thing for a project manager to, to optimize um, what work that needs to be done, what works that can delay, when to do that, how to organize that work. Um, but don't be rigid about, oh, you know, don't think 10 steps ahead. Two, three steps ahead, just focus on those and try to optimize that. Does that make sense? Questions? About the last on the, on this page? Yeah. Delivering value quickly increases ROI. So delivering value quickly increases ROI. So delivering value to the end customer increases ROI because they have realized the value, right? You have delivered a feature to them ahead of time so they can start using it and they can realize the value of that, right? 
because otherwise if you wait till let's say your software is going to come in three months, right? Then they haven't realized the value of the return, right? So, but I say I'm going to deliver five features, but I'm going to deliver the first feature that you can use it and you can actually start using it, then you realize your return and they paid you up front, right? That's what it is. Same thing, um, you know, car is a bad example of the car that I ordered, you know, it's, it's for the car dealer, it makes total sense because they got $5,000 advance payment ahead and they can put that in the bank and collect interest on that. So their, their return of investment is much higher. And then they also committed me not to go into, it's a non-refundable deposit, so that you won't go to somewhere else, right? But they have to guarantee me six weeks delivery. If it is later, then I might ask for some more concessions, right? So, so that's the kind of thing, thinking you want to do. So there is a return on investment if you get committed early. Okay, so I think this is not new, but in software, you as a project manager have a lot of things that you could do. So if you search the internet, you know, this is the basic seven principles that you should think and live by as a project manager. We talked about eliminate waste. We are gonna go into each one of these and talk through what those are for software, okay? Eliminate waste. Amplify learning, and this is what you learned by doing one iteration. You try to apply that across as well. We'll talk about that. Decide as late as possible. I think I, think I mentioned that, right? Um, you, you don't plan everything up front. I mean, you plan up front, but you don't get into the details of everything at the beginning. You just work on the, the top three things. Um, deliver as fast as possible. That means you're shrinking the waste between this one and that one by doing these two in parallel and just not doing this work until these two are ready. So if you, if you drew a dependency, curve, dependency graph, it'll look like this. Um, Say, say this one needs to be ready and that one needs to be ready before you could assemble the page, this page. Right. There's a dependency here, there's a dependency here. So you could work that in parallel, you could work this in parallel, but you can't touch this one until either one of those are done or both of those are done. So you're saying don't decide on page seven, only do one or two pages in advance. That gets the pattern going, yeah. So when I did our construction project, we had a set of fire doors that had to um, be engineered and designed, and it. it took eight weeks for those to be designed. Right. So at some point, we knew they had to be installed by this date, so it's like, hey, we need to give them their their rough outs and stuff like that at least eight weeks before that. So weird engineering projects, I don't know how it relates to software, but if you knew something that was down the road that had a critical function and you knew it was gonna take a while, um, you would know Hey, I need to start get that, that week up four right. yep. um, to be able to get it done by week nine or something along those lines. Or, or you have to do an inspection before you can do, say the electrical inspection needs to be done before you can do the drywall or something, okay. right? So you have to schedule, but the electrical inspector won't show up just because you told him yesterday, right? Yeah. So you got to schedule that like three weeks in advance so that that guy shows up on that day. So. You can start to work on it, but the electrical inspector needs to be scheduled like three weeks in advance so that he shows up on that day. On that day, you haven't done your drywall, but you have done your electrical work. That makes sense? Yeah. All right, similar. So, so deliver as fast as possible. That means deliver the value to the customer as fast as possible. The fifth one is empower the team. Let the team come up with best ways to do it because they know what the mechanics of that, right? They would know the dependency. You as a project manager may not know it all, but don't be like a know-it-all person. Just ask them, hey, in order for you to deliver, who do you depend on? What do you need to have? Do you have everything you need? 
And if you're blocked, you need to let me know. So those are the kind of things you want to talk with your developers. Build integrity in, and we'll talk about that, and you have to see the whole. You as a project manager needs to understand the whole picture. You need to understand what those 24 pages are, but you don't need to know all the details. You have to have the whole understood. So let's go through each one of these and talk about what each, these, what each one of these are. So what is waste? Anything that does not create value from client's point of view, if you can't link the work that you're doing to the value that's created from client's point of view, that should be considered a waste. And or in the work that you are doing does not improve the quality of the code, I should be considered waste. Or it does not reduce the time and the effort needed to take to produce the code. So you can you can say the quality, right? The time, and then value to customers. So that's features, right? Essentially. So features, quality, time, and that's what you're trying to optimize, right? Those are the thing, three things you're trying to optimize. Some of the steps may not, may be extra steps. You should try and eliminate those steps. You know, say, hey, I have to get approval from this person, or the designer should look at this before. Let's say, let's say you um, do a design and you check with customers, and then you give it to developers, and the developer says, you know what, this, this cannot be implemented. This is going to take too long. What process change you need to make? So, you know, she did the design. She, she goes to me, the customer, and says, hey, do you like the design? And I say, yep, it works. Then she goes to the developer, Colter, and Colter says, you know what, that's going to take a lot of time to design and a lot of time to implement. And so you now have a situation. What would you do as a project manager? I'd probably get the client and the designer in on the same meeting, like, hey, what's realistic? Yeah, absolutely, and we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. But now you have to think ahead next time around, do I need to make a process change here? Yeah, I'd say so. What, what would that be? The next, the, the next page design, I would get both the, I mean, if she does a design, she says, hey, check with Colter before we show it to customer that this can be implemented. Yeah, Not going to all the details of actually implementing it, but just check with them. Hey, can this be done? Can we put this dialog box in here? Can we put the search box in here? Would you be able to implement this? Would it take a lot of time to implement? How much effort it is? But don't implement it, but at least check with them. So that when you go to the client, you can commit fully. I'm Sean Ferrari, said you. Right, right, exactly. So uh, that's, so this actually happened to me in, in our project. The designer did all the design work. He took it to the users, did the user testing. They all liked it. And then we came to the developer, and the developer says, it's going to take me too long to implement this. I wish you checked with me before we show it, show it to the cloud. So things like that, you as a project manager want to think about that. So what, what do we do there? What do we do there? We avoided rework, right? We avoided rework. We avoided making commitment to customers until um, the implementer gets in. So we changed the process in our, in our project and say, hey, anytime Lou does a design, he needs to check with Bill to make sure that he can implement that. And then they're on the same page, then they go to, go to the client. OK? Um, so what is waste in software development? Let's think about that. So let me ask the question. What is waste in software development? General. 
else, anything that's not creating value. Yep, okay. You waste a lot of time on coding, but the final result is not very, um, not very, not improved remarkably. Mm, okay, so, so what you started with is what you ended, not ended up with when you delivered, right? So it took a lot of time to figure exactly the right design, right? Yeah. So That's one. Yeah. To, to avoid to avoid that, shall we um, design carefully before we start coding? Right. 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 So here's a couple of things to think about. Um, partially done work, and that's what we talked about before. That you got started on six, seven tasks in Sprint, and you touched on each one of these, and you decided you just can't deliver the last one, and you wasted time, right? So partially done work is one. Extra features, oh, you know what, sometimes you will get from developers, hey, you know, actually I can throw in a, a search bar in here. You know, I could put, I could put the, in this page, I could put the last time this was modified. I could put that cool feature in there. Do you want me to put that in there? Really? Is it adding any value to customers? <coughs> Extra features, those kind of things you should try and avoid. Just focus, right? That's a focus question, right? Extra processes? Extra processes, oh, we have to get approval from our boss and things like that. Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe in your environment, you know, that you are given the authority to go do that. You may not be. So you find the... It's easier to ask forgiveness than to ask permission in certain cases if you know your boundaries. Yeah, you have to manage. I'll give you one example, okay? Um, so everything we do, any websites we design at OIT, it needs to have accessibility. That means, you know, if somebody is disabled, they should be able to access that page. Say somebody don't have a good eyesight, they should be able to have a screen reader read that for them. And that's a requirement. That's a law. Every website. That's Every website we do. Yes. And see, you might get sued by SELU or somebody like that if they didn't have that. So we have a group that's job is to check for accessibility, just to make sure that that this page or this app that we designed will work with the screen reader. You know what a screen reader is? A screen reader is that can look at this page and actually read it to you instead of somebody who has a visual impairment. They can just listen to the page and it will describe the page. You have it on your iPhone as well. So anyway, um, or if you have a building, you have to have a ramp. ADA, yeah, otherwise you just won't be able to get the building done, right? So that's a good example. So those kind of work, um, you have to know that up front, and you can, you can say, hey, you know, after we are done, we are going to come and talk to you, the accessibility to make sure. And that's what the typical process is. And we'll get the product done, and we'll go to accessibility. I changed that process and said, hey, let's get accessibility involved up front, looking at our design. You know, then they can say, hey, avoid having scrolling windows or things like that. They say, hey, don't have a lot of big scroll bar because, you know, that will be a lot of information. Or the most important information, put that at the top then the screen reader would just read that and they can move on. Otherwise, they have to wait for the entire page to show up, and then the most important thing that changed in the page is in the last line. They have to listen through the whole thing. You normally have log in, log out. At the very top. At the very top. So those kind of things. So some patterns you understand, and then you apply those patterns, and you avoid the extra process. So when you go to accessibility, you understand their hot buttons, their design patterns. You have addressed most of them. 
in, as part of your design, as part of your implementation. So when you go to accessibility in the final review for approval of your product to be released, there's only minor changes you have to make. Does that make sense? Yeah, so understanding that, and the same thing, you know, like, so this is sometimes comes through experience, and sometimes, yeah. You know, it's just like knowing that you have to have city approval, get a permit to do a basement remodel. You as an experienced general contractor should know that, and you know what not to do so that you can get that approval, right? Things up to code and all that kind of stuff, okay? So accessibility is one of the things in software development. It is a law in the United States. I don't know about the other countries. Um, that anything you design needs to be accessible for somebody who is uh, visually impaired or anything like that, okay? So those are extra processes that you have to do, but you want to try and minimize or avoid those by building that into your, your work. So what's waste in um, software development? Let's talk about that. Let's refresh what we talked about. We talked about task switching. That's a waste, right? What else is a waste? So how do you how do you get task switching? How does it how does it happen? So if you had if you're on two or three different projects. That's right. Two or three different projects that that require many interruptions. You have to context switch, right? That is waste. What else is a waste? Well, need some time to get used to their new position, new job, new work, new job. Say that again. So people um, need some time to um, know to get themselves familiar with their new jobs. Okay, so people need to learn what the job is and get adapted to the understanding, yes. I wouldn't call that a waste. It's sort of a necessary. They have to understand that, right, in order to do that, right? So you have to build that into your planning. So let's say we have a new project, we have a new employee coming in, right? I typically assign a week for them to get oriented. Right, so I try to say, okay, they're going to spend a day in their paperwork and the HR things, right? And then four days, they're going to pair with one of my developers and work on a couple of stories, so they're up to speed. They have to set up their environment, they have to set up their laptop. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So I wouldn't call that a waste. I would try to optimize that waste as much as I can, but it's necessary, right? Without that, they can't do their job. Yeah. But things like if I, okay, you are all ready, your environment is ready, but now you're waiting for the design to come, that's a waste, right? That's something that we control, right? We as a group, as a project team, control. Hey, you know, this person is waiting for you to, for the design page, and you don't have the design ready, right? So it's a shame on project manager who didn't think about that and got that task assigned to the designer up front, okay? So delays is one of the biggest wastes in software development, right? We're just waiting for somebody. Oh, somebody has to do this. Oh, I have finished all my stories. Now testing hasn't been done. The test group hasn't done that work. So we can't go into production. And the test group is backlogged. There's only two people who does the testing, and they got 20 tasks to do. 20, 20 stories that they have to test, and our story is waiting, and we can't go to production. Do you guys understand the whole, um, I think we talked about this in, so, say, uh, in development, in development, this is backlog. Backlog in development, um, uh, I should say, uh, say in analysis and in testing, 
uh, in production. So actually, this analysis should should come here. All right. So you have work backlog, do an analysis, do the development, move it to testing, and then in production. This is all in one sprint. Okay. Let's say let's say you finished five stories. And but in testing, there is already seven stories in the backlog, and now you're piling on testing, and they can't finish it. Now you're waiting. Because your story is not done until it goes into production. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? In production means you know it's gone to the customer. It's, it's live. It's live on the website or live on the product, right? Okay. So an example would be, you know, let's say there are 10 features for the iPhone, the next iPhone that's update that you're going to get, and nine of them are tested, and, and then the last one is waiting, and they can't make that release. Does that make sense? Handoffs is another one. Handoffs, you know, you're waiting from in development, you've finished all the working, and you're handed off to testing, and they're doing the testing, or the UAT. You know, that's handoff, and there's gaps in between. And, you know, you are trying to optimize that. That's the waste. What's an obvious waste that we haven't talked about? Bugs, right? Definitely. I know it's going to happen, but so what do you do? What do you do to find, avoid uh, defects? Try to minimize them up front. Yeah, you know, think through as much as you can, right? TDD, you saw TDD, right? Test driven development. They spend a lot of two people working on a story, right? Yeah, one person doing it, one person overlooking it. Overlooking. Oh. Exactly. They're thinking at the same time, so you're catching things. It is costly, but it's, it's effective for critical pieces. We don't do TDD or test-driven development for everything we do, but for critical parts, we do that. Or pair programming, they call it. That's okay. what they were calling us. Yeah. And so test often and release to production as soon as possible. OK? Um, so let's talk about the biggest waste. Three biggest waste. Um, extra features, we talked about that. Um, so you, you're trying to find that 20% of the features that gives you 80% of the benefits, right? You know, the 80-20 rule. That's what you're trying to you know, find. And the other thing that is a waste is the churn. Churn means what? Um, what is churn? For our sales, churn was we got a new customer and they didn't like us and uh, different requirements, right? Yeah. Or change of requirements. Yeah. yeah. That means does that make sense, Yuri? Yeah. yeah. Change of requirements is going to create delay of work, rework, all of that kind of stuff, right? So we talked about accessibility. We talked about ramps. We talked about city inspections. All of those things could create churn if they have not fully understood and planned ahead up front, right? So if you have requirement churn, or you have text fixing cycles, you're testing too late, you found something, you didn't test early enough, you found something, now you have to go and do the rework. You don't want to keep doing that many times, but there are times you have to do that. The other one is sort of crossing boundaries, organizational boundaries. So that means, hey, we depend on this other group that needs to do the, um, let's say, the, you know, they're not part of the Scrum. It's a different group. We have to push all of this code to put it in production. And the production group is a different group. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's say, let's say you, you're, Sprint team has developers, QA, UI designers, and project managers. But you don't have DevOps. 
DevOps are the people who put things into production. You don't have that in your team. Now you, you know, you've done all your work. You are ready to put that in production. You have done the testing. Now you have to cross the organization and give it to a different organization that does put things into production. You're likely going to have a waste of time. So how would you, how would you address each one of these? So how do you address extra features? How would you eliminate extra features? Hopefully every client on hand as much as possible to figure out what your highest priority. Yeah. Highest priority item, right? And the highest priority is designed, is defined by the customer value. Hopefully you can just differentiate between a need and a wish. Yes, absolutely, that's for sure. Yes. And then oh, you have 10 items you can work on. The way you would decide is what's the most important thing? What, what's not important thing for the customer, but what's the biggest value we can bring to the customer? What's the biggest value that we can bring to the customer? And the customer may not know that some all the time. But you as a team decide, okay, this is the biggest value we can bring to the customer. And try and be honest about that, right? And then churn, we talked about that, you know, that is being planning, you know, and knowing things up front, what needs to be done, and delaying requirements till the end, you know, you can reduce churn. And then organizational boundary crossing, right? You know, we talked about, hey, we got to tell the city for the electrician, um, the inspector to be here, right? Because it's crossing boundaries. He's going he's gonna to come in only on the 17th. So you guys better be ready. And when the inspector comes in on the 17th, that you are done with your electrical work. Okay. Any questions on the waste? Is it possible to avoid all of this? I think it's too hard. A lot of times, is it possible to avoid all of this? Uh, is the question. Um, over time, yes. Over time. Over time means not over time, over time, over time, but this is over multiple iterations, multiple sprints, you get the hang of doing things and putting things in production. That's what I meant by that. So you do two sprints, three sprints, you're better, you're constantly improving. So over multiple sprints, you're going to get a lot better. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, you're going to have some work, rework in the first sprint. You know, you figure this dependency. You change the process, right? You change the process for accessibility, right? And so once you've got several features, page one, page two, out into production, you figured out where your biggest, biggest ways are. So when do you discuss all of this in your agile workflow? In your retro. In your retro. So this is what you should be discussing. What worked? What didn't work? What can we do to fix? So every sprint should almost ramp up, depending on the work you're doing, but exactly. it should be more efficient every sprint. Yeah. Yeah. Pick the topmost thing that you can fix to reduce waste or more lean about it and just only do that better. Let's say you figured out in the first sprint, hey, you know, we didn't think about accessibility. Let's have the accessibility team come and present to us. Take two hours, have the accessibility team come and present to us. What's the best practices? What do we need to do? What should we, we as a team be aware to avoid this pitfall we had. If you did that in your next sprint and the other sprint after that, you're going to be more conscious and you won't have that five hours you wasted on nice accessibility. Okay? And then you as a, through experience too, too you know, over the time, you know, I mean, when I came in to OIT, I didn't know much about all the requirements for the university, right? But when I got through a couple of projects, I understand now where my bottlenecks are, which one is going to take more time, so I plan ahead, right? 
So I didn't know that I have to go through a review or change a change board. There's a board that looks at all the changes and approves changes. I have to go through them in order to put something in production. So when I did the first project, okay, we are done, you know, we tested everything, it works fine, let's put it in production. They said, oh, no, 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 you got to go tell the change board that you're making this change. And they have to tell the customers and they have to get the customers ready and train all of that and that's going to take two weeks to do it. Okay, or I could say, hey, I need more and uh, three developers for this new project. And they say, oh, it's going to take us three months to hire these people. So, you know, I, I had to figure out, you know, how do we get that work done? So one of the creative ways I did that was, you know, let's hire some contractors. And if they are good, you know, they can apply for the job and we can hire them full time. That's one way you can get going. Okay, so you have to think about eliminating waste uh, up front. So I'm going to go through the, so, so we did all of this. We talked through all of that waiting, delays, handoffs, defects. We talked about the three biggest waste, extra features. Churn, and we also talked about crossing boundaries or dependencies outside, right? We're going to talk about Amplify Learning. So let's take a quick break, 10-minute break, 7.30. Be back here. We talked about this. So second learning in the seven things in Lean is Amplify Learning. So what does it mean? Do the work, discuss what went wrong, fix the process, do more work. Sort of a cycle, right? So this is um, learning from the past, keep from making the same mistakes again. That's what we just talked about before the break, right? Retros. In retros, you figure out what went wrong in the last one. We're not going to do this again. This is how we're going to fix it. Somebody actually owns it, gets that fixed. You as a team, you know, don't do that same mistake. So I wouldn't call it a mistake, you know, you make an improvement to the process. And oh, sometimes, you know, you know, hey, you know, this time we have to talk to their DevOps. Let's get the DevOps guys involved so we can cut short the time to go into production. Let's get accessibility involved so that we don't need to cross that boundary. We are ready when we go live. We have done the accessibility work. Okay? So a good project manager just looks for this. When you do amplify learning, you are shortening what? The time because the delays you are eliminating, right? You are eliminating. So what are the specific things that you come out of Amplify Learning? Um, so sometimes you don't know, you know how to do certain things, and you know, that's why you create sort of rapid experiments, or what do you call sometimes spikes, spikes. So you quickly do something, you figure that out, then you have a better estimate. Instead of you bring that story in-house, that you don't fully understand, then you're churning, trying to figure this out. Send off one person and say, here, go figure this out. Break the story, understand this, tell us exactly what stuff needs to be done, and create stories and get that done. Okay? So I'll give you one example. In my group, you know, we have Salesforce development as well. And Salesforce is, has an equivalent to JavaScript in the application called light, uh, Lightning. And they found some bugs in it, so they're going to lock that down. So they're going to make some changes. Entire Salesforce, all customers are going to get this change in June. So now we have to figure out, we have to adapt all our programs that we wrote to that new model. Okay? So we don't know. It's brand new. That just came out. Salesforce just announced, you know, all our customers in June are going to be converted 
to this locking service. So we got to go figure out what's this new locking service that we have to do. Which one of our products are going to be affected? And when that's turned on, all our stuff's going to break, or the stuff that depends on it's going to break. Access to that stuff before Jim? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so I don't know how much you guys know about Salesforce. Salesforce control the entire environment. You know, they have deployment, everything. There's their platform as a service that, so you don't get to create your own website, you don't get to host it, you just run it on Salesforce. So if they change something, it affects all their customers. Okay? So you just got to make sure that, so they announce in three months we're going to roll this out. So if you have lightning components, you need to make sure that all your lightning components are locker compliant. That means they're locked down for, against this security flaw. Okay. So now you have to make post changes for already things you are deployed. You don't know, it's an unknown, right? It's a brand new thing that they introduced, so we gotta make sure that everything, so I sent off one person and said, hey, you go figure this out, convert all of this, and learn from it. We don't know how long it's gonna take, maybe two weeks, maybe four weeks, but take whatever is needed, just figure this out, but don't interrupt this one, this workflow. So he got it out, and he did some of the implementation that works, now he takes that learning and brings to the team, and then, you know, go do that, right? So that's the, create a hypothesis, say if you did this, this will work, and try that out, and then implement the best outcome. Okay, that's an example. Standards, what about standards? Talked about accessibility, right? Now there's a 508 standard that's created by US um, Bureau of Standards. That says, you know, your web page needs to be able to be read by these screen readers. That means, yeah, go ahead. You always um, try to hold yourself to the strictest standards just so you encompass everything, or just hone in first and kind of a ballpark. Yeah, there are two components to standard. One is you have to meet the standard, right? Yeah. The other one is standards that are best practice, if you did this, you know, it'll automatically meet, right? So I think I tend to do the latter, you know, what's the best practice to implement accessibility and do that, and then through proxy, we will co comply with the standard, yeah. But not try and, read, try and read the standard and try and implement every single thing over there. What's the best practice to implement a website that is allowed by screen readers, okay? So standards are great, um, but even standards can be improved, right? So that's, that's the best practice I'm talking about, okay? So that means don't implement everything. Here's the top three things. If you did this, you get an 80% score done, you can move on. Then you can do the 20% whenever you get to it, time because you will pass the test, okay? The other one is uh, predictability. That means, hey, if we deploy something, we have to go through this deployment group. We can predict this is what needs to be done, right? So, so you can plan for it, right? So standards, predictability, learning, all of that. So sometimes people create wikis and document all of these. Sometimes they put it in the code and say, hey, if you did these things, it'll be fine. So can you think of anything about, anything else about Amplify Learning? You know, how do you Amplify Learning? What else, what else you could do? Definitely every sprint do a retro and try and improve things, right? And then create, hey, if we do a project, we do these things for sure. Accessibility, we need to um, have websites this way. We need to have logos this way. So everybody knows in order to get a product out, we have to do these things. There's, there's no other way. Does that make sense, Jerry? Yeah. All right. So that's the second one, Amplify Learning. First one is eliminating waste, Amplify Learning. Third one is delay commitment. 
That sounds like counterintuitive. It's like, why would you want to delay? Don't you want to commit right away? A lot of things can change between your end and the client's end. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I give you an assignment. Do you want to wait till the last moment and submit it? No, you want to submit it first. That's a different philosophy. <laughs> I don't know, I tend to do is, I tend to do all the work necessary, get that ready, but I wouldn't submit right away. I would still submit at the last moment, but I'm ready, right? There may be some new information that might come through, right? Maybe I give a hand, or maybe, oh, you know, I wasted all this time figuring this out, right? Or, um, or there might be some changes, or maybe the deadline is extended, or things like that. Like, or you might talk to somebody and you learn something, you want to incorporate that, right? So, but, so plan, but don't do the full commit until the last moment. Make a committed decision. Major benefit is maximizes the cost of change, right? And change cannot be incurred until development is underway, right? So you have to make the development and then... So commitments, if you look at that, um, you, want to, you want to try and delay the decisions. Um, you plan, but don't put that in production yet. And also try and make decisions that are reversible, if at all possible, right? Hey, we don't need to, we implement this, okay, that's the decision we made, but can we pull that back, take that out? Stop further into delay commitment. Yeah, this doesn't mean that you do not plan. Okay, you do plan, right? So don't make a, don't misinterpret this. You do plan, like I said, and planning is not a commitment. Commitment is delivery and actually implementation, right? You plan for something. So a lot of times, you know, if I have an assignment, I tend to do that assignment as soon as possible in the context of what I, what was given. But I don't submit. So I'll give you one example at work. So I have to write annual performance review for all my employees. There are 15 of them, and it's due on 31st of March every year. I can just wait till 30th of March and try and do all 15. I'll be, there, you know, I'll be just overwhelmed, right? So what would I do? This is a quarterly or a yearly? This is annual review, once a year. This is, and you've done it before, right? Mm hmm So judging by how many people you have to review this year, kind of give it a time frame of when you need to start thinking about it and then chunk it out um, so you can give yourself ample time between wherever you need to start. And so we have 15 first. people, 15 days, right? That's what you've done. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's one. All right, first time manager. All right, your second time manager. What would you do? All right, he suggested that you've done that. What would you improve on it? Um, I don't have any good idea. Okay. Um, Which, okay, I'll give you some more hints. So it's a one year's worth of work yeah. that they did that I have to write review in the last 15 days. A lot of stuff to review. That's right. And I have to sit down with them, review with them. They have to understand what they did. What happens in one year? You forget a lot of stuff that you did in April, May, June, July, and you only remember the last three months you did. Oh, make, um, make log. Make what? Record of what you have done. Yeah. Exactly. See, now we are getting into the details, right? So every quarter, 
I, I don't want to do it every month. It's a lot of work, right? Every quarter, every three months, we write down quarterly goals. For the last three months you did this work, what are you going to do for the next three months? We write that down. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, into the same performance document that we write. Every one of them, I sit down at the end of, the, end of three months, we sit down and go through, what did you do last three months, and what are you planning on doing for the next three months? They come up with it, I don't. They think what their achievements are, and we write that down. So when the performance review comes in March, all I have to do is just last one and go review all of those together and give a rating and get that done, right? And it's fair too, right? And it's fair because we got that all that document. We've done the work up front. But we haven't committed and submitted the ratings. You understand? So, so the planning allows, so we planned and did chunks of work, gotten ready. I mean, that's one of the reasons I gave um, the final project. We know it's a lot of work to get to the final project. When do we talk about the final project first? She's like my first day of class. First day of class. First day of class, we talked about the final project. We talked about the midterm every single week in between that, now and then. So I had a force, forcing function for the midterm because I don't want to have the draft of the abstract come in the week before the finals. I also laid out to you that we're going to have eight discussions. We started discussions very early on, right? We have done three so far. We've got five more to go. So you know how to plan and all of that, right? So planning, that's planning. But we haven't done, we chunked out the work in a way that you can manage yourself, you know the schedule and all of that, right? Same thing, the, the, if, if you didn't get started on your final project by now, you know, you better get going real quick, right? But that's why we forced the midterm to be a write-up and it must be submitted by that day. Right? That forces you to you know, start to work on it, start to think about it. Because a lot of it's background thinking, back, you know, work that you need to do, interviews you need to schedule, things you need to think about, research you need to do, all of that. I was thinking about that this over the weekend. And it's like, if you required uh, you know, two pages of the final project to do every other week, I was like, that would make me, between here and the rest of the year, or semester, that would be awesome. Um, I just have to force myself to do it. <laughs> that's right. So I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the delay commitment, is delayed delivery, but you do a lot of work and planning up front. Okay? So U.S. project managers truly needs to, when you start up these meetings, you know, you have to take about 10, 15 minutes to prepare. Every single meeting, you know, that I have, I prepare for that. Every single lecture, even though I have given this lecture multiple times, I still prepare for that, what we are going to be talking about. We start on time, all of that kind of stuff, right? Questions about delay commitment? It makes sense now, right? Yeah. The next one is deliver fast. Why? value to your customer so they yeah that's right you know you deliver incrementally but you deliver fast right so short iterations allows you to deliver value earlier right so you don't wait till all pages all 24 pages are designed right we talked about um, that that 24 pages We've done the work up front to understand what those 24 pages are, but we didn't do all the design, right? So that allows us to deliver this two pages that allows you to create an update. It doesn't allow you to delete. It doesn't allow you to um, link something else, but it delivers these two values. Remember in the, uh, the mail example, we talked about What's the MVP? 
we don't need to deliver everything else. We just deliver the MVP, right? So that's, again, is deliver fast. Okay? Questions? Make sense? So quick turnaround time, short considerations, right? It allows you to find quickly. Requirements are assessed. Benefits are realized. And it's in production, they're using it. So, but deliver fast doesn't mean that you hurry up and deliver something, you know, haste is waste, right? It does not mean developing without planning. Hey, let's hack something together and let's try and deliver this without testing, without thinking about the overall architecture, without thinking about any of these. So you plan and, and then you can do iterations, but you should be ready to change. So, you know, again, another thing is deliver fast allows you to cycle, you know, drive down the cycle time by delivering small chunk of meaningful work that is useful to customers. Not because it's smallest chunk, but if it's not meaningful to the customer and it doesn't deliver value, they just feel like it's noise, right? You're delivering something, but they can't use it. It's, not, it's, it's no value to them. Okay, so right now we are doing a project that allows the faculty to allocate all the funding that they have in the College of Arts and Sciences. They have nine big chunks of work they do. They create budget journal entries, they create commitments, they create reports, they um, provide people administrative access, so nine major functions. <coughs> we went and asked them, what's the most critical function you do if we give you that function, not all nine, just one function, would you use it? And what would that be? And they said, oh, we just create budget journal entries every single day, so that we submit this budget journal entries to PeopleSoft every single day, or at least every single week. That, you know, hey, the funding allocation changed, this is what everybody should be getting. So they said, if, if we deliver that to you, they will use it, even though eight other functions are not available. Right yeah, so, so we've been working on it for three months. You know, we're going to deliver that. But it's going to take another six, seven, eight months to deliver everything else. But we've delivered value within three months instead of waiting nine months. And then every two weeks after that, they say, yeah, every, every month after that, it takes longer than that. Every month after that, they'll get some new features. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think we talked about the MVP. So here, here this is. Let's say budget journal entry feature, admin feature, report feature, email feature. This may not, all, may not make sense to you, but there are nine features. So we created uh, an app that has these nine boxes, but we're only going to deal with this. The other boxes are all empty. They don't do anything. They just look pretty on the thing, but there's nothing underneath that. But if you get them, they, they told us that they can actually use this to submit all the budget journal entries to PeopleSoft. This is the backend system. So they can create journal entry and submit to PeopleSoft. That's major functionality that they do. And we deliver that, we deliver value to them. So that's going to take three months to do. This might take one month to do. That might take another two months to do. That might take one month to do and so on and so forth. But now, you have delivered value incrementally. Say this is a whole project, nine months. You have delivered value in the first three months. There's a lot of foundation work we have to do, but you got BJE, and you got a report. 
you got an email, and you complete the project in nine months. I'm trying to give you an example so that it makes sense to you instead of trying to talk abstract here. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's what deliver fast means. Deliver fast means you plan for the whole thing, but you deliver value quickly as possible. If we could wait nine months and deliver the whole thing, what would have happened if we did that? They might have forgot. They might have think that you forgot about them when they started. That could be one. Other places. Yeah, you know, you showed up nine months ago, and you know, it's nothing happened. Yeah, right? That's one. They found another solution to that. Yeah, they found another solution. Yes. What else? What else could happen? Oh, they thought, oh, we want a tenth one now. Right? Oh, we want a tenth one. Oh, we don't need this anymore any longer. That could happen. Right? But it's all good. We didn't waste any time. We didn't waste designing all of that. When we delivered, they said, oh, you know what? We don't need this feature anymore. So if I deliver incrementally. It's your customer input. Yeah. So that's the advantage of software. I mean, you can't quite do that in hardware business or building a house, for that matter. I mean, if you don't have a full house, <laughs> there's nothing you could do, right? Even if you had one room, it's still not quite usable. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean? So that's the advantage of software. That's the difference between physical world and the software world, OK? Questions? Yes. Any example about the fourth one? The fourth, the fourth, fourth, fourth one? Yeah. Limit size of this one? Yes. So limit size of requirement in process to your ability to deliver. So size, so size of the requirements means um, you don't need to gather all these requirements. You you kind of know at the highest level what the requirements are. We know we have to do an email feature, but we don't need to dive into it now, okay? We just need to plan for it. We should know a high level. Hey, in database, we need to make sure that we have a field. We need to write some APIs. It needs to fit in the screen. We don't need to design the UI yet, right? But we know what the template of the UI looks like, but we didn't do any work. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. All right. So the next one is empower the team, respect people. And this is kind of touchy-feely thing, but tell me, it's also somewhat cultural, but definitely in this country. And I believe all human aspects, you know, when you listen to people, they're more receptive. They're, they're buying in, right? We talked about the buy-in and the developers. You know, if more times they're empowered to make the decision, uh, then you have a better outcome. Let's think about... Um, why that is more important? Because you as a project manager may know at high level how things look like, but they would know in order to do this BJE, they have to talk to people soft. They know about the APIs, right? They know about um, a warehouse where they have to go pull all that information. They know about that. You don't need to know, right? And you wouldn't know anyway. Otherwise, you would be a programmer yourself, right? Or even if you're a programmer, they know intimately more about that. And that's why you hired them in the first place. So you hire somebody, and then you're trying to tell them what to do. Then basically, it's all your knowledge, and you're not leveraging their knowledge, OK? You have to appreciate that they know a lot, the developers and the UI designers and the testers and the QA team, they know better about their job than you do. 
because they've been added. Even though you may have done that job some time back, they're current practitioners, right? So, so that's one aspect. Definitely they do know more than you about the specifics, right? But what's more important than that? More important than that they feel if you give them, empower them, they have ownership. Take pride. They have ownership means your job is a lot easier. Because they feel like they own it, they're going to get that done, and you don't need to tell them to get that done. Okay? So how do you work in your work environment when you work? How do you do that? Uh, I have small teams, and we try to be independent from my store compared to other stores, uh, and then each individual, uh, we kind of let them do their own sales pitch and stuff along those lines. And so we always went through, um, when we coached them after a, a sale, you know, what could have gone better, what could have gone worse, we always did the PCS, you know, appraisal and right concerned about what could have been done differently, and then a solution. So we always came out with, you know, praising them and like, hey, you're doing a job. I, I saw these really this good way. points. Yep. Uh, some praises to improvement, you know, you forgot to mention this, or you know, you could have expanded on that. You know, so in the future, you might bring that up first or stuff along those lines. So it was a lot of uh, letting them do it themselves without micromanaging or getting in there and doing it. With Otherwise, you end up doing it, right? It took me a long time to, because I was a salesperson before that and a top end salesperson. And then when I became a manager, I felt I had to do everything. And so I micromanaged everybody. It's like, no, look how I'm doing it. It took me a while to be able to step back. Like, all right, learn from your mistakes. And I mean, these are your clients now, not my clients. Even if they make mistakes. Even if they make mistakes. Even if you know they're, they're making mistakes. mistakes. But they won't learn unless they make they mistakes. They have to make the mistake for themselves. How does it work in, in Taiwan, right? Yeah, how does it work there? Um, yeah. I mean, does your manager give you the freedom to go do that? Um, experience that I um, worked for a project. I have three teammates. Yeah. I, we don't have a leader. We don't have a leader, but I think I behaved like a leader, like a manager. Um, and the, the group is very complicated. It, it, it was... Um, there, there are two Chinese students, one Indian students, and one American American students in that thing. So, I think we we, we really have very different habits. Like um, the two Chinese students always wanna go to me, <laughs> always wanna take a nap after lunch, and like, and the American students, she refused to work on weekends. And the Indian students, he he was he was ill, so he can he cannot he cannot uh, do a lot of a con a contribution on our task. Um, so I I empower the team by by work with each of them individually. So I got a lot of time on that. And I work, I work with that Chinese students when we are all free, and I on weekends. That so I can, so I can, uh, so I can spend spend my time with that American student during mm -hmm. weekdays. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest problem <laughs> was that in your students, but um, I'm still I'm still right? Yeah. Uh, I started the team by. Try to persuade them, um, because in, in in the field of EECS there are a lot of Asian 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 employees. So I try to persuade that American students that well, if you wanna if you're interested in this field, you will have to deal with um, people from Asia. Mm. It is a good time for you to um, try to uh, get them to learn something and grow and everything. Right? Yeah. So yeah, the key thing what you're saying is what's in it for them, right? Right. What is good for that individual? For them, yeah. And just understanding that and enabling them, and then giving them the freedom to make that mistake and learn. Yeah. And to those Chinese students, I said, well, in this country, many people they they just they just don't take snap after lunch, and uh, in American companies they. 
they want to give you a very long time, not yeah. like in my country. Yeah. They want to give you a very long time to, to take a snack yeah. or to enjoy your lunch. Right, right. right. It's a you to um, get used to that. If, yes. you wanna, if you want to work in this country after graduation. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's definitely cultural differences, right? But I think the key fundamental thing across culture is understanding their motivation. You know, what, what's in it for them, right? You know, and some people like praises, some people like autonomy, some people like pay. It's just different things, right? So, or maybe a combination of some of those things. So you're just trying to understand, and a lot of times with software developers, what's important for them? Typically, most of the software developers I hire, I make sure that when I hire that they want to grow. It's important for them that they themselves want to grow technical capabilities and personally they want to grow, that they want to learn and they want to grow. I hire for that. I only hire those people who want to do that. And then it fits the culture. But there are other cultures as well. I'm not saying that'll work. But for me personally, I just hire those people who want to learn, who have put in the effort um, that they want to learn. And then I can provide a learning environment. I can provide a learning opportunity. I can provide them with a project that they can make mistakes and learn. Because they came here because they wanted to learn. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so when you hire, there is an aspect that you have to hire for. But if you hire for, you know, like, hey, you want to get home run hitters in your team, and you got nine, nine people who are home run hitters. But there's no shortstop. There's no pitcher. There's no catcher. And I just hire a different team. I hire a baseball team, right? I don't hire all home run hitters. So there are people who are home run hitters, and we need them in the team, but we also need shortstop. Too many superstars. Sometimes can't get anything done with them. Well, I mean, they have a purpose. They have a purpose. You know, when there's crunch time, they can go hit that. That's fine. But we still need to do catch, pitch, throw the ball. Yeah, we still have to do Hit singles, right? Still hit singles, right? Does that make sense? I really have a, a question. Yeah. Like, like in case study one, um, cultural dysfunction was mentioned. Yes. Yeah. And like, uh, like what I just said, I worked in different groups. Yeah. Um, sometimes I, sometimes they are Chinese students who are just like me, and sometimes I work in more complicated. Uh, more like uh, yeah. in some groups that uh, I have American, Indian, or Pakistan mm -hmm. teammates, and I think uh, people from different cultural backgrounds do have different thoughts, and that sometimes can um, that can be a good thing for our projects. Yes, diversity, different way of thinking. Yes, yeah. Um, the efficiency yes. will, be will be a problem if we cannot um, we cannot make a very good negotiation with each other. Right? right, right. How would you solve that? That's a trade-off, right? Yeah. How would you solve that kind of stuff? In, in my experience, those groups are small groups. So mm -hmm. I can solve those groups. So I can solve those pro this this problem in the way like I, what I said. I um, try to persuade uh, persuade them individually. But if I was a manager in a very large group, a large company, do you think is this is is that still a practical way to solve this problem? Yeah. So how would you how would you manage a large group? Is that the question, right? You know, you, you can manage a small group, you can persuade them, right? Yeah. How would you do at a larger group, right? That's the question? Because in a large group, I think um, it is very likely that people from different backgrounds yes. will become small groups right. in a large group. Right. So it would be more difficult to affect them. To, yeah. to, make a, to make a very essential, critical influence on them. 
Yeah. So one way, again, you know, it goes back to hiring. Oh. Yeah. So when you hire, you hire for the culture. Okay, you want to, let's say you want to start a company that you want to grow up to be, say, 100 people, okay, over the next three years, let's say. You hire the first three set of people or five set of people that has the same culture, and over time they're going to become managers of the next set of people you're going to hire, right? So you all agree on that culture when you expand, you can influence that culture because you hired this value, not racially or ethnically, the same people, that's all diverse, but value, right? You know, what, what you value? In my group, we value learning. We value high quality software. We value independence. Those are, those are our values, right? People have flexible time, but they have to get the job done. Quality is important, quantity is important. But and, and quality is important, timeliness is important. When I do performance review, I grade those two things. So you have to reinforce, you have to hire for the culture and also reinforce. So you hire for these values. So when you interview, you talk about, tell me about the quality of the job you did. Tell me about the, um, you, uh, project you delivered on time. That will tell you a lot about whether that person fits in your culture or not, right? So you have to hire for the culture. And then the second part of that is you have to reinforce. A reinforce means what you reward them with is for those values. So when you give a raise or when you give a praise or when you recognize somebody, you say you did this because you delivered on time. We are giving you this reward because you delivered on time with quality. And we as a group value that. Not because you did 10 things and Colter only did three things. That's not a value to us. Because you are a home run hitter, he's a shortstop. That's fine. You hit three runs, you hit 10 runs. We are not rewarding that. You're rewarding timeliness and quality. You see what I mean? So in my performance review, those are two separate, uh, separate items. So you have to hire for that, and you have to reward that. So it reinforces other. OK? So where you come from, what background you have, how many different companies you work for, I like different things. OK? I like that the more diverse it is better not just culturally or racially or anything, but what different companies they work for, okay? What different technologies that they know. The, the more, the better, or different, the better. Just because you have the same values, that doesn't mean you hire the same type of people. Do you understand? They could be different types. So that's how you manage a larger team. That's how you grow a bigger culture. So I worked for an organization, you know, and I joined, you know, it was like 1,000 people in the company. Over 15 years, we grew up to be 20,000 people, 40,000 people. We were, at Sun, we were, when I joined, it was a billion-dollar company. And when I left, it was $200 billion company. So I think you have to hire for that culture, and you have to reinforce the culture. And that's how you manage large teams. Because you can't just go and look at every single thing they do, right? So Sun is known for innovation. Sun is known for delivering high-quality products. Look at Mercedes. What comes to your mind? Design and quality. Yeah. Prestigious, expensive, quality. Right? They hire for that. They build for that. You're not going to get a Mercedes that is $20,000. Maybe no, but... But, you know, said it's $70,000, $80,000, but it it will run, right? So you can count on that, right? So they, they built a culture for that. So I think that's what, so you can empower the people, respect the people, but you got to hire for that. Does that answer your question? It's a long answer, but, okay. Okay. All right, so I think empower the team is a big part of, 
being able to scale. Otherwise, you'll be doing their work, you'll be telling them what to do, and they're not bought into it. They'll do 80% of the work. They won't give 100%, 120%. I want 120% out of my employees. And how do I do that? If they feel like they're bought into the vision, they feel like they're doing it for themselves, they're, they feel like by doing this, they're learning. By learning, they're helping themselves. And there is something in it for them, not just a job. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the people who work in my group, they just don't work for me. They work for themselves in a way. Because by doing these projects, they're actually learning themselves. Because they came here because to learn. Does that make sense? Every one of my employees go for a conference every year. No matter where, which organization I work for, they always go for a conference. And I allocate that budget up front. So I think these are kind of management things that I was going to talk in the next lecture. Next, next set of things, yeah. Okay. So, so the next thing is build integrity in is... Um, this integrity means, you know, that the customers, um, the, you know, the quality, this is the, this is a quality piece. Remember that if you continuously find defects in your testing and verification process, um, you're, you're continuously improving, right? And that's what, um, that's what uh, TDD is. That's what, you know, getting specifications, um, creating complete code. Uh, that's what um, automated testing means. All of that is quality, right? right? Building integrity in, that means the system can test itself. If you do TDD or, or test classes, you guys know about test classes? You know, when you write a class, you write a test class that tests itself. TDD is test-driven development, right? Paired programming, all of those are, all, all of those are, um, I mean, if you know about automated unit test and all of that, every, every functional component has a unit test, and using that unit test, you can build a whole regression test. Um, acceptance test, you know, how do you accept a given requirement? How do you make sure that the requirement is met? You specify, if you did this and this and this, then that meets the requirement. So that's what the integrity in. So you can build that into the product, okay? So let's talk a couple of examples. This is kind of hard to understand, this one, right? It's hard to understand. So when you write a class in a lot of the programming language, you can write a test class. And that test class can be automatically executed when the code is executed. So it can test itself. So if you change the class, and the test class can catch those changes. Or if you have an error, it can catch that. The other one is regression test. That means you design the whole system. You put that out in production. You make sure that these features all work. And then you added a new feature. Then everything that worked before, how do you make sure that everything that worked before continued to work, that you didn't break anything? Okay, so you could build this automated regression test so you run that every single time when you release a product. So you're building on something, you're not breaking things that already work. Okay, so um, test-driven development is when you develop something at, at Pivotal, they do TDD. That's what's called TDD, test-driven development. Um, so you develop something, you write a test for it. Every single thing they write, right? every single time they die, write that they write a test for it. They in fact write the test first, and then write the code. A lot of times. Okay, so that's what I mean by building integrity. And you could let the system to test itself, so that the failures are caught. That makes sense. I'll give you an example. So how do they do these things? So 
So you guys know hard, um, hard disks fail, right? Hard disks that you have on your computers fail at some times. Physically? Physically, yeah. Yeah. Have you had that happen to you, any one of you? No hard disk fail for you. Ever. <laughs> okay. My senior design project for Mechanical here uh, was for Seagate, and we designed a testing platform to raise the temperature and lower the temperature at different RPMs so they can test the deflection um, at, at the extreme temperatures. So that's kind of funny. Then. Yeah, so things fail. So let's say Facebook. How many hard disks do they have? How many hard disks that Facebook has? I don't use Facebook. A billion could be, right? To store all your photos. You know, you got to store all your videos, all your communications, all your profiles. And then you keep adding to it. You never delete anything, right? So they got to have a billion of hard disks, right? Do you think one of them failed? All the time. All the time, right? What do they do? Back up everything in triplicates. How long it takes to back up your hard disk? One hard disk. If it's a full backup? Yeah, full backup. Mm -hmm. Hours, right? It, let's, say, let's say you even do incremental backup. You're changing photos. You're uploading photos every single minute. Every second, there's 20,000 photos uploaded. Every second. So how do you back up? So you can't back up. Right? Even if you back up, you, can't, you have to restore. You have to wipe every Facebook and restore the whole thing, right? So backing up is not a solution. Or restoring is not a solution at Facebook. So what do you do? You know hard disk is going to fail. You fix, you put a new hard disk in, you walk over here, the next disk fail. Because there are billions. Say 100 million, let's not talk about 100 million hard disks, let's say. You have 100 million hard disks. Let me draw a picture. Let me draw a picture. Let's say this is Facebook's data center in Iowa. Okay? And there are disks. Let's say there are 10,000 of those here, and then 10,000 of those here. All right? Somewhere here, one fails. Somewhere here, five seconds later, another one fails. So we have like 10,000 times 10,000, you know, you say a billion hard disks are there, okay? And they're going to fail. So what do they do? They have to build integrity in to this to make sure that if it fails, that it doesn't affect bring down the system. Because it cannot be backed up, it cannot be retrieved. So what they do is, when you upload a photo, they keep a copy here, they keep a copy here, they keep a copy here. Three copies. And let's say this disk fails. They put in a physical new disk. And while you're watching uh, your photos and everything, it makes sure it had it here. It makes a copy of it here and co compares these two and makes a copy of the whole disk again. They know where to look. Where to look and where to copy all the time. And it's constantly doing that every single moment, even if you're viewing it. Because your viewing is coming from these two and not from that. So they keep three copies of everything you do in three physical disks. And sometimes geographically across in a different country, the same photos are kept. Is that it's not even in a... a Facebook is developed? No, no, no. That's, you know, for Google, everybody, yeah. Okay. That's yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how it's said. So they built the integrity uh, in, even if you have systems fail, that you build the integrity in. So you have to think about, as a project manager, you have to think about failure and error and defects and say, hey, is there a way that I could automate the detection of it so that I can make continuous improvement? Because I'm going to scale 
And when I scale, you know, I, because I'm going to do multiple iteration, right? I'm going to do sprints every two weeks. Every two weeks when I deliver something, how can I make sure that, that it all continued to build on what I delivered first? That it didn't break what I delivered on sprint one. Let's say you delivered on sprint one a feature, sprint two a feature, sprint three a feature, sprint four a feature. When you deliver sprint five, you broke something in sprint one. Not a good thing, right? That could happen, right? Because you changed some of the functionality here, right? So you have to build automated tests every single time. This is what TDD is, and this is what test class is. This is what regression test is, right? So you build that integrity in. So when you do release five, before you release five, what do you do? You run through the test for all of these before you, before you release fifth. So that means you made sure with one, two, three, four, five, it all works the way, and one, two, three, four still works. Okay? So that's what, that's what building integrity in. What does it avoid? But it's going to cost you some time to do that, right? That's right. It avoids rework, and that's one of our principles, remember? That's one of our principles before. It avoids rework. Even though you spend time doing some extra work, in the long run it avoids rework. You following me? Make sense? Okay. So you as a project manager really should in, in, ask the question, what questions would you ask of the team? Hey, do we have regression tests? Do we have test classes? Right? How do we know, or more generically, how do we know that what we delivered in one, two, three, four sprints continued to work the way that we said it would work? What did you do to make sure that this release five didn't break anything in one, two, three, four? Questions? Does it make sense? It's a little extra effort, right, to do that. You're smiling. What are you thinking? I think it's, it's kind of like what a lot of people do in a uh, power transformation system. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, people uh, cost them more money on building more, uh, a more complex system to make sure that if one point fails, um, power from other points can... Yes. Yeah. So, so Facebook, just so that you guys know, this is not all in Iowa. They might keep one of these copies, one of the three copies, say in, say in California. Why is that? Because the whole building burned down. Either. Yeah, exactly. All right? So there's a copy out there somewhere. There's a meta. So how do they know where is what? Or they need to know where to look. That's right. So there's a, there's a high-level system that has pointers to each one of these, where each one of these things resides. It's like an index. Just like in a book, there's an index. Is that like a distributed system? Is that a what? Uh, is that like, does that work like, like a distributed system? It is. It is. It is a distribution system. So now, now my next question is, what happens if that fails? That's a little bit worse of a situation. So what do you do? It, it can fail, too. So that itself needs to be backed up twice, right? That needs to have always in multiple places, and that index is always synced. That's always, the index is always synced, and it's in every single location. So it's in California, it's in Iowa, and it's in other places. I'm oversimplifying this. This is actually multi-level. Multi this is multi-level. I mean, it's not just one level. Well, it's multi-level means it's, it's, this is one level of indirection. There could be another index on top of it that covers everything. Okay. So that's how they keep track of it. It's like one big giant file system, just like on your desk. 
Your disk is also organized this way, very similar. It's got an index, and then it has files. OK? So that's what building integrity means, right? That what are they avoiding here? They're avoiding backup and recovery. They're minimizing risk. Well, they just can't do that, right? I mean, it's not acceptable to have a product that's down everything. It's like, oh, we have to recover, you know, the entire Facebook. It's just not possible, right? A billion people would never use it. Yeah? So last one is see the whole world. So um, look to the whole process uh, for waste improvement. So you just have to have a bigger view of the whole thing and say where you're, um, where you're spending most of the time. That doesn't mean you measure every single step, but you know, hey, when we release this first feature, right, when we release this first feature, how do we spend time? Where do we spend most of our time? So you might say, hey, we spend our time in the release. We, we did the coding, we did the design, it's all worked fine. But when we put it into production, that spent five days. We did seven days to design all of this, but we spent five days to put that in production. So you intuitively know that you cannot optimize this anymore or you have done the optimization for that. But this one can be cut down in one day. Then you would work on that, get that fixed, right? So next time you go, your work, your next sprint to production, how many days? Seven plus one. That's eight instead of 13, right? The 13, five plus 12, right? Because 5 plus 7 is what you had in the first sprint. Now you have 7 plus 1. Because you optimized this. You got it? Make sense? And then next sprint, next sprint you go, you have now 8 days. And you say, hey, if I had the design, I could cut down. If I had the design in advance, I could cut down one day of waiting. So now I have 6 plus one. Back to the original. You understand? So you're, you're continuously optimizing. But you're looking at the whole picture of what works and what doesn't work. Any questions? Hopefully this is useful. Yeah, so I think, you know, just looking at lean development is not trying to cut cost or have pay people less or things like that. It's not what that is for. You're just trying to optimize as much as you can. And the principles is what you need to pay attention to. It's very difficult. It requires a lot of experience, practical experience, right, to identify um, what is waste and what's not. Yeah. Exactly. Where you have the waste. It's, it's, I mean, the good analogy is the supply chain in, in building a car, right? Or you can think of other places you worked in civil engineering, you can think of what it takes to get a house done, right? And how can you shrink that? How can you do the next house more efficiently? Or... Uh, it's always a lot quicker and easier. Yeah, because you know, right? You worked out the kinks in the system, right? And that, but, but the nice thing about software is you can continue to improve, right? Every iteration is like building a new house. And every iteration you can improve, and that's why you have retros. And then you have to have this open communication. You have to have this open communication. Because you might think someplace is where the inefficiency is, but it might take, but if you have the whole team view, then you know they would have a better idea, right? All right, that's it for today, and um, now I'm not going to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in an article about about Scrum, uh, Scrum development, I read um, it says that Scrum will allow uh, allows um, some failures 
like like if, if the team promised to um, release the new function, uh, several several new functions, but but one of them um, failed. It is allowable in Scrum development, right? Is that true? But that's the most important one in terms of value to the customer. It's not just one functionality. That's oversimplifying. You might deliver two functionality, that's fine, but the most important thing from a customer point of view, right? And so, but, you're, you know, it can be multiple functionalities depending on the capability of the team and the sprint length and everything. But typically, yes, you're right. You want to have focus and depending on how big you want to think that feature is, right? For instance, I talked about the BJE, the nine things that I showed you in the previous diagram, right? This one, I talked about the nine things. This is, this took actually five sprints to deliver. Yeah. But within that, I have specific functionality. Yeah. It's, it's all relative. Yeah. Okay. Sprints, so the first four sprints, you didn't actually give anything to the customer, right? Because you didn't have... No, we didn't do it. You didn't have a working full... Yeah, we had to get a lot of things done because we had to do a lot of legwork for all nine things. Yeah. That's why the second one is one month. So the customer doesn't necessarily have to get every, something after every sprint. Yeah, but especially at the beginning of the project, you can't deliver. Yeah, you have that MVP. Yeah. Make sense? All right, see you next week, and I'll post uh, the discussion tonight. Okay. Thank you, Alison.